Good evening, everyone. I am Sonia Tucker. I'm the program manager for the Liber Coalition of San Diego. Welcome to our first presentation in our Liber Q&A for the series of 2021. We're very excited tonight to have a great presenter that will be talking about a very critical topic, COVID vaccine and liver disease. Before we get started, I want to share a little bit about the Liver Coalition of San Diego. We're a local organization that was formed by medical specialists, transplant, transplant surgeons, patients, and caregivers. The idea is to promote the health, the liver health, and to meet the needs of those affected by liver conditions here in San Diego County. All the funds that are going to be raised will stay here in San Diego to support the community-based education program and the services in the community. This webinar series was created as an avenue to produce this possible learning opportunity for the patients, for the caregivers, to give you guys the opportunity to ask questions about your liver and liver conditions. And this webinar is being recorded in case that you want to go back and check it out later. And it will be posted in our website, theLiverCoalition.org. Under programs, you got a webinar library and you'll find it right there. However, tonight would not have been possible without the sponsor, the support of Dynavax. So I want to introduce you guys to Carl from Dynavax. So Carl, do you want to say a few words? Thank you, Sonia. I appreciate your introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. everyone. We at Dynavax uh, are so excited that we can support this community event. And we really are driven by patients and caregivers and, and partnering with them. Now at Dynavax, we are very, very interested in infectious diseases that have no cure where we can develop vaccines. Now you might think I'm talking about COVID and while Dynavax does have some partnerships to help develop COVID vaccines, our primary area of focus is hepatitis B. You may know that this is a, an infectious disease with no cure. So vaccinations are very, very critical in helping prevent the 5,000 deaths a year from chronic hep B. Now at Dynavax, we have come out with the very first two dose, one month hepatitis B vaccine for adults, which is very, very different than the old vaccine that's three doses over six months. And I just would like to reiterate, we are ecstatic to be able to support this event and this series. And I'll turn it back over to uh, Sonia. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Carl. Uh, before uh, we start the presentation and before I introduce you to our moderator, I want to remind all the participants that if you have any questions during the presentation, please use the question feature on your screen. We will be putting all those questions together and uh, we will be sharing those questions at the Q&A session at the end of the presentation with Dr. Oliver. At this point, I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Cheerly. Shirley is a PharmD from UCSD. She also has a lot of experience working with liver patients and transplant patients at UCSD. And Shirley will introduce you guys to uh, our presenter, Dr. Oliver. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, good evening. I'm Shirley Tsunoda. I'm a professor at the School of Pharmacy at UC San Diego, and I practice in liver transplant. And I'm also the co-chair of the Associate Medical Advisory Committee for the Liver Coalition. So I'm really excited to be here with you tonight. And I'm very excited to introduce Dr. Deanna Oliver, who is going to be our speaker today. And she's from the Southern California GI Liver Center. And she's here to talk to us about the COVID vaccine and liver disease. And as Sonia mentioned, I will be monitoring the, um, the question section of the, um, chat function. So feel free to put your questions there, or we also want to keep it um, informal. If you want to um, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question, Dr. Oliver can also take questions as she's going along. 
So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Deanna Oliver. Hello, everyone. Give me one moment just to get my screen up. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for the Liver Coalition inviting me uh, to give this presentation tonight. Um, I know the COVID-19 vaccine is important for everyone to learn about and especially important in our patients with chronic diseases, such as patients with liver disease. Uh, my name's uh, Deanna Oliver. I work with the Southern California GI Liver Center, um, taking care of uh, general hepatology patients and pre and post transplant patients. So my agenda for tonight is to kind of go over quickly, I know we're all hearing numbers all the time, but to go over our kind of our current status of the COVID-19 pandemic, and then just go into kind of generic about, well, how do vaccines actually work? Um, talking a little bit about uh, COVID-19 and how infection with COVID-19 is impacting our patients with liver disease. And finally, going over the current status of the COVID-19 vaccines uh, in the United States. All right, so first we'll start with the uh, statistics about the pandemic. Uh, these are pretty recent data from a few days ago. Uh, I know every day we're hearing numbers. Um, Um, okay, sorry about that. So globally, the mortality rate is about 2%. And you can see when the data starts coming down in the United States, about 1.7%, California, 1.2%, and in San Diego, 1% uh, mortality. Now, obviously, these numbers are the number of cases that we know, um, and there's obviously going to be some of the data that we don't have uh, from various countries that can't supply us that information. What, one uh, thing I wanted to say, as of January 20th, we have 152,000 people vaccinated in San Diego. Uh, I just we found it interesting, kind of the ratio of female to males being vaccinated. And then when we look at the different races um, of Hispanic, Latino, and white, and then if we combine the, the other races or unknown races um, that probably fit into one of these categories above, gives us a little bit more information about who's getting vaccinated so far in the past month uh, since vaccinas vaccinations have been available in San Diego. The whole idea behind vaccination is the impact that COVID 19's had uh, in our hospital settings and with family and friends. And I'm hoping that this trend that you're seeing, if you look at the purple line, uh, kind of gives us some hope that maybe the numbers of new cases are coming down a little bit over time since January 12th uh, through the 20th. So we're, you know, I'm hoping that this trend continues and we've kind of hit the peak and we're starting to maybe come down again uh, with the amount of cases of COVID-19 uh, in the area. The whole reason we're talking about all of uh, COVID every day on the news is the census in the hospitals. Uh, myself, over the summer, I was working specifically with COVID patients. Um, and a lot of my colleagues I know are having a lot of fatigue. Some of my colleagues have been working, you know, every day for the past three months. And it's really these numbers. If you look, for example, just on January 20th at the 1,656 patients admitted in San Diego uh, with COVID-19 who wouldn't normally be admitted, you can imagine that that strain on top of the normal amount of patients that are in the hospital is what's impacting our facilities. We all talk about the ICU bed capacity, and you can see that in all of San Diego for the past month, we've had about 35 to 40 patient, 40 beds available at any given time. And uh, obviously that's something that 
we're all looking at because if we need an ICU bed, we want to have one available to us. I like this table because it kind of shows how the the uh, number of cases have gone up. I know everybody's having to sacrifice and wearing our masks and uh, staying away from families. And so we can see there is definitely a difference whenever we relax some of the um, the things that we're supposed to do and you can start seeing the spikes obviously over the holidays um, and our fatigue of having to be home and stay away from family this fatigue is real for everybody and we can see the impact of uh, that fatigue and us wanting to visit our families with the number of cases increasing along with what we've been hearing about in the news that there are these new um, new mutations in the COVID virus, which might be making the virus uh, a little bit more easy to spread amongst people. Now, again, I'm hoping that this, uh, this curve continues to trend down. Uh, the idea is maybe we hit our peak and we're starting to head down the other direction. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that if I were to put this slide up in another month that we keep seeing this, this amount of hospitalized patients come down uh, to give some relief to all the physicians and nurses and respiratory therapists who've been working so hard the past months taking care of patients, along with all the support staff in the hospitals. So now let's move a little bit into how do vaccines actually work? Uh, what is a vaccine at the end of the day? It's really just a simple, effective way to protect people against harmful diseases before we come in contact with them. So a vaccine is a way to train our body and our immune system to create antibodies, just like it does when we are exposed to the disease in our natural habitat. And why is it so important? Well, we know that the vaccines that we have available to us now are protecting up to 3 million lives a year. Things like diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, influenza, measles, all the vaccines that most of us took in our childhood uh, protect us from getting the actual disease if we encounter it. And obviously, we're not just protecting ourselves, but we're protecting those around us so that we don't pass disease to others. So how do the vaccines actually work? They basically are reducing the risk of our body uh, getting the actual infection by protecting us with something that we call antibodies, which everyone's been hearing a lot about. So let's say I have a vaccine, I encounter a disease, it comes into my system, and then my body says, oh, I recognize that, the antibody is able to go quickly and get rid of the disease and fight it. And in some cases, maybe it doesn't completely prevent you from getting the disease, um, but it at least gives your body a head start into fighting the disease itself. So it all comes down to kind of why should each of us get vaccinated? And really the two reasons to get vaccinated are pretty straightforward, is to protect yourself and to protect those around us. And we have to always remember, not everyone can get vaccinated, um, such as young babies or people who have certain allergies. Um, and the certain, certain vaccines, for example, patients can't get vaccinated if they've had their spleen taken out. And not everyone who gets the vaccine actually has protection from the disease. For example, myself, I took my MMR, my measles, mumps, and rubella, but unfortunately, I never have created immunity to measles and mumps. So everybody else who gets vaccinated around me is protecting me since I don't have immunity to those diseases. Now, let's talk a little bit about COVID-19 infection in patients with liver disease, which I know you're all interested to hear about. So something that we're asking ourselves is, do our liver patients actually have an increased risk of getting COVID-19? Um, so if, if I'm in a room and I don't have liver disease and someone else is in the room who has liver disease and we encounter someone with COVID-19, is the liver patient more likely to get the disease? And so far data isn't showing that because you have liver disease, 
that you actually have an increased risk of catching COVID-19. Uh, so it seems that everyone's kind of on the same um, playing field when it comes to your risk of catching the virus from somebody else. This, though, I think is a major difference between patients um, who have chronic liver disease and their risk of getting severe COVID-19. Um, it falls in line with uh, some of the other comorbidities that you've been hearing about. So a patient who has diabetes or someone who has a heart failure or chronic kidney disease, uh, obesity, hypertension, kind of the ones we're hearing in the media are always obesity, hypertension, diabetes. Those are kind of the three that everybody talks about. But, you know, we don't really hear about, well, what about patients with chronic liver disease? Now, obviously, data on this is very preliminary because we don't have uh, a lot of data. but the different papers are kind of showing that patients with chronic liver disease do have an increased mortality compared to those patients who don't have chronic liver disease. One of the studies showed that the mortality was between 4 and 12 percent, which is obviously more if we remember back to that initial slide that we looked at of the San Diego mortality of 1 percent, or even the U.S. mortality wasn't up to 4 percent to 12 percent. Um, and in this specific study, uh, about half of the patients, their liver disease was fatty liver, um, and then um, other liver disease made up the other 50%. Interestingly enough, it doesn't seem that patients who've had liver transplant who are on immunosuppression have an increased risk of mortality. But again, this data is very early, so we'll have to see as we go along if we're running into uh, increased mortality in our liver transplant patients. But so far, everything I looked into, it doesn't appear um, that there's an increased mortality for patients who've had liver transplant on immunosuppression. Uh, what seems to be consistent is that patients who have cirrhosis do seem to have an increased mortality. One of, the, one of the papers that um, came out was a cohort study of patients, about 150 patients, 103 of them cirrhotic from an international registry. Now, some of you may know what child's A, B, and C is. This is basically a patient with cirrhosis, um, and that's how much scarring's in our liver. So we have a scale of zero to four, zero being, zero being no scarring all the way up to four, which means severe scarring or cirrhosis. And then when we look at our patients with the severe scarring or cirrhosis, uh, we have three different levels that we talk about, child's A, child's B, and child's C. So child's A would be someone who is walking around. We don't really know that they have any liver disease. Uh, child's B would someone who you can tell maybe they have something going on, they have a little bit of yellowing to their skin, or they have fluid in their stomach or their legs. Um, they're coming to the doctor's office more frequently. And then child C would be more consistent with our patients who are admitted to the hospital frequently um, with complications from their severe scarring or their cirrhosis. And uh, this study showed that the mortality is pretty significantly elevated in our cirrhotic patients. Now, anecdotally, um, the patients in our group, uh, I don't feel that the mortality is this high. And obviously, when we're doing registries, we always have to take the data with a little bit of a grain of salt, because likely these are patients who were admitted to the hospital, um, and maybe this mortality is more applicable to a cirrhotic patient who actually gets admitted to the hospital versus all cirrhotic patients, um, because obviously, um, I've had lots of patients with cirrhosis who never actually end up in the hospital, but were diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, but the patients who do have cirrhosis who end up in the hospital um, do seem to have a little bit um, a sicker course, a little bit harder time. Um, although I don't feel that the mortality for my group, where we have a lot of cirrhotic patients, reaches these numbers at all. Uh, but it's important for us to kind of extrapolate that data and say, well, at least we know there's probably an increased um, chance of someone dying if they have cirrhosis and they get infection with COVID-19. 
So let's talk a little bit now about the different COVID-19 vaccines, um, current vaccines in development. Uh, I can't mention all of them, obviously. Uh, what's available to us right now in the United States is the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. Um, there's quite a few vaccines in phase three clinical trials, uh, such as the AstraZeneca, the Janssen, the Novavax, um, probably you've been hearing about the Johnson & Johnson. Um, as we know, the Pfizer and Moderna are this new type of vaccine, the mRNA vaccine. Um, the AstraZeneca, Janssen, and Novavax, uh, these are all uh, a common type of vaccine with an adenovirus that has that spike protein you've probably been hearing about. Um, which which we'll go into a little bit of detail of how that works now. And then it's important to know that the WHO, even now, this is probably outdated, even though I put this 50 in there about uh, 48 hours ago. Uh, I read just today, now they're saying there's about 70, I, I, I get different numbers, 70 to 120 different vaccines and different phases of clinical trial development. Um, so there's a lot more on the horizon. But obviously, all of these vaccines have to go through the appropriate tests uh, to make sure it's safe for all of us to be taking the vaccine. So I know everybody has been hearing about the mRNA vaccine and that this is a new type of vaccine. Um, basically, what the mRNA vaccine is doing is called a messenger RNA. And these messenger RNAs we have in our system already, they give the body instructions to make different things. And this messenger RNA vaccine specifically has our cell make this spike protein. Okay, now when the cell has the spike protein on it, our body notices it and our immune system goes and responds and makes antibodies to the spike protein. And in the end, the result is that our body is learning how to protect us against future infections. Now that's a lot of words and I always like pictures. So a colleague of mine developed this for her patients and uh, allowed me to borrow it. So when you look at the picture, you see the red guy up in the corner. This is the COVID-19 virus. And attached to that, you'll see all the little spike proteins, okay? And those spike proteins are what allows the virus to actually get into our cells and infect us, okay? So along comes our mRNA virus. And the messenger RNA basically has a recipe that tells our body, make the spike protein. So it obviously isn't making the virus, it's just making the little triangles or the spike protein. So now the spike protein is in our system and our body recognizes this as something that shouldn't be there. And then our body creates antibodies to the spike protein. And then once, we come in count, we encounter COVID-19 in the future after we've been Im immunized. COVID-19, the red guy with all the spikes comes into our system and our body already knows that this is not supposed to be there. It has great memory and all these antibodies go and attach themselves to the spike protein. And then the COVID-19 virus can't get into our cells. So I really like this picture because it gives us an idea that what the mRNA vaccine is actually doing is making these little spike proteins or the triangles, and that's what's training our body how to protect ourselves from when we encounter the virus in the future. So some things that I've been reading about or I hear on social media uh, is that it's going to um, cause our DNA to change or it's going to give us the virus. But if we think back to that picture now we have in our mind, what the mRNA vaccine is actually making are those little triangles, it's not making the virus. So they can't actually cause us to get the COVID-19 virus um, because we're not using any sort of live virus that causes COVID-19. And they don't affect or interact with our DNA in any way. So the messenger RNA is never going into the nucleus of our cell, which is this part of our cell that carries and keeps our DNA um, and they'll never interact. So I think that's really important because I've been seeing a lot of this on social media that the mRNA virus is gonna change our DNA. Um, and definitely there's no interaction between these two things. Uh, and as soon as the messenger RNA is used, our cells say, okay, we don't need this anymore, just like it would normally. 
and they degrade and get rid of the messenger RNA as soon as it's done using the recipe to make those spike proteins. So let's talk about a little bit about who should get the vaccine. So currently the recommendation is that anyone over the age of 16 who does not meet the severe allergic reaction contraindication should get the vaccine. Uh, vaccine and liver transplant. So, you know, unfortunately, uh, because this is also new, right, everybody wants data about can I get the vaccine in this or that. Uh, you know, we don't have data yet available to us to say, uh, should we get the vaccine and all these different things such as liver transplant, patients who have cancer, who are immunocompromised. Um, but the general sense is, is that the benefits of a vaccine outweigh the potential risk for transplant patients. Um, and obviously, anyone with liver transplant is going to be talking to their team and their transplant team to discuss their individual case because everybody has their own individual case. Um, but really, um, in general, the consensus is the risk of getting the virus and having a severe reaction from the virus would be more than the risk of taking the vaccine, okay? So who should not get the COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, really the only contraindication would be someone who has a severe allergic reaction or anaphylaxis to any component of the current COVID-19 vaccine. Now this is gonna change, right? This is just the um, contraindication for the mRNA vaccines. Um, as the new vaccines come out, each one's going to have a little bit different um, criteria for who should not get it. But these vaccines um, are made of kind of lipids, salt, sugars, um, sodium, and then polyethylene glycol. Uh, a version of that is in each vaccine. So if anyone has ever had allergic reaction to this, then that would be someone who shouldn't get the messenger RNA vaccine that contains this. And then if anyone had a severe reaction, obviously to their first dose of the messenger RNA um, vaccine, um, would not be recommended to get that, that second dose of their vaccine. Now, small reactions, um, even intermediate, you'd have to talk to your um, doctor, uh, to be prepared for the second part of the vaccine. And then, you know, those are gonna be case by case and talking with your primary care doctor or your liver doctor about whether or not you should take the vaccine uh, would be the next step. Now, precautions to the vaccine. Um, these are things that we're precautioning people, but it doesn't mean you can't get the vaccine. So anytime anyone's had a severe allergic reaction, um, that actually required epinephrine or hospitalization, you really need to discuss that with your primary care physician or with your specialist to decide and really go over what happened, what the um, allergic reaction was to. Uh, if you've had a previous immunization and had an allergic reaction, then it's important to discuss that uh, with your physician uh, on a case-by-case -case basis to decide whether or not you should move forward with having uh, one of these vaccines. And then a uh, good question that I've heard was, what about all these other allergies that people have? Um, now, if you have any sort of um, food allergy, venom, latex, uh, anything not related to a vaccine or injectable, there's no reason for you not to get the vaccine. Any allergies to oral medications, which many people have, uh, allergies to things like penicillin or other antibiotics or other medications you've taken in your life, um, that is not a contraindication uh, to taking the vaccine. Uh, if you had a non-serious allergy to a vaccine or some injectable, something that you injected into the system, uh, you're still okay to take the vaccine. Um, any family history of anaphylaxis or other anaphylaxis completely unrelated to vaccines or injectables, you can still get the vaccine, okay? So what are you gonna expect after the vaccine? The most common uh, side effects that you're going to have um, is gonna be pain or swelling on the arm. That's at the site of the injection. And then throughout the rest of your body, you might experience some fevers, chills, tiredness, or headache. 
Um, these are all expected. Uh, some people feel like, oh, I got a fever or chills, so I got the virus, but actually um, this is just your immune system doing its job and recognizing the vaccine. But the symptoms can range from zero symptoms to having all the symptoms that we have listed there. And one that I didn't have listed that seems to be common, people are uh, getting sometimes a rash around the site of the injection uh, site, okay? Some helpful tips after you get the vaccine to reduce your pain that you get in the arm, uh, just like many of us who've gotten the flu shot that have that pain in our arm, we're gonna, you can apply a clean, cool, wet washcloth, exercise the arm, move it, that seems to help. And then to reduce any discomfort from fever, we want you to drink plenty of fluids, dress lightly, um, and that should help you get through the process after the vaccine. And more importantly, when should we call the doctor uh, after we have the vaccine? So if you start to have redden, redness or tenderness where you got the shot and it's increasing a few days after the shot, then you wanna give your doctor a call and let them know about it. And then if your side effects are worrying you or don't seem to be going away after a few days, then you definitely wanna give your doctor a call. Keep in mind that um, with COVID-19 so easily spread, you could actually come in contact with the virus and get the vaccine and you could start having symptoms of the virus. And I don't want you to confuse that uh, with the actual virus that you got infected with because you want to try to prevent further spread. I've had a few of my physician friends who got the vaccine and then two days later uh, started having symptoms from COVID-19 and had actually been infected prior, you know, probably four or five days prior to getting the vaccine. So we don't want you um, staying at home and thinking, oh, this is just the vaccine. If the symptoms start to get worse, it's possible you may have actually contracted COVID-19 around the same time that you got the vaccination. So at any time you feel worried, give your doctor a call and go over the symptoms that you're having. Now, when you go to get your vaccine, um, if you've had any sort of history of anaphylaxis in the past for any reason, they're gonna want you to stick around for 30 minutes for observation and everyone else is gonna have to stay for 15 minutes. Um, this way, if anyone has any sort of allergic reaction, they'll be available to help you out and get you any medical care that you need. Now, some people, I know it's been in the news about the recent Moderna batch, um, the lot 041L20A. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's not a lot of information that I can give you specifics about what the side effects uh, were, the allergic reactions that they have. Um, I've seen numbers between six, seven, but definitely less than 10 healthcare workers who had had the vaccine um, had apparent allergic reactions. Um, initially, they recommended to hold this batch, which is standard process. Uh, the amount of allergic reactions were more than what was expected. So um, according to the, the guidelines and the rules, they put a hold on utilizing that batch um, and they investigated. And actually a few days ago, that lot has been released again for use because they didn't find that there was anything specific um, that explained why we had that small cluster of six or seven um, healthcare workers who had allergic reaction. I do know that um, from some information that it seems that some of them had had history of allergic reactions in the past, um, but everybody recovered fine um, and everyone did well afterwards. And now uh, the lot has been released again for uh, people to use. Uh, most importantly, what's the effectiveness of the vaccine? Uh, so in my mind, these are the same numbers, uh, the Pfizer vaccine, 95% effective, the Moderna vaccine, 94.1% effective. Uh, one thing to really remember is that immunity isn't achieved until about two weeks after the second shot. So if you get the Pfizer vaccine, your immunity won't be um, there for five weeks, okay? And if you get the Moderna vaccine, it'll be six weeks after your very first shot because the Pfizer vaccine separated by three weeks. And if you add those two extra weeks, you know, from day one, five weeks later, then with the Pfizer vaccine, you should be immune to the uh, COVID-19. And with Moderna, it's gonna be six weeks after your first shot. 
So when can I get my vaccine? Uh, I get this question uh, many times a day now, uh, and let me go over it with you. So right now we're vaccinating. Uh, I know we've been hearing about the phases. So the phase 1A, tier one, tier two, and tier three. Um, so you can kind of look over this uh, as I'm talking, but obviously uh, these are people who um, work in healthcare settings, EMTs, uh, dialysis centers, uh, people who are vaccinating obviously need to be vaccinated. Um, and then they moved into kind of this tier two, which uh, moved out of kind of that acute care setting into other settings for healthcare workers. Um, and then any other kind of pharmacy, dental staff uh, kind of fit into that tier three. And then just recently, uh, we opened up to 65 years and older. Um, and as you can see, then uh, phase 1B includes that 65 years or older, and those at risk of exposure in their work in education, childcare, emergency services, food and agriculture, that'll be the next batch. And then the tier two for the phase 1B, again, is going to expand um, to uh, congregate settings and even more people who are, ex are at risk of exposure in their work, like transportation. Um, and residential uh, and sheltering facilities and services. And then, you know, the idea behind this is that February 2021 is when we're going to be hitting this, uh, the entire phase 1B. And then 1C, they don't have an estimate as to when they're going to be opening this uh, phase up, but this would include um, those that are between 50 and 64 years old or people from 16 to 49 years old with high-risk conditions, which would include those patients with liver disease and then other essential workers. So most of uh, my patients are gonna, unless they're healthcare workers, are going to fit into this um, 1C group if they're 64 years or younger, and then the rest of um, my patients and the other liver patients, um, if they're over 65, are already able to get vaccinated. So obviously this is the group that we are all waiting for to be able to have access to vaccine because it's the largest part of the population that's at risk for um, severe disease with COVID-19. And then finally, phase two would be the general population and anyone over 16 years of age. So again, just to reiterate, in San Diego, uh, currently all the phase one, all tier, 1A, all tiers, and individuals 65 years and older. Thank you very much. And I wouldn't be giving this talk if I wasn't willing to get the vaccine myself. Uh, so here I am back in December, uh, feeling pretty excited to get the vaccine after working in the hospitals for so many months. Um, and so I appreciate your attention and I'll take any questions and hopefully I can answer them for you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. We, we do have um, a few questions in the question chat box. So um, one of the questions is about um, pediatric patients. So, you know, we know that the neither um, vaccine is approved for children. And I believe, is it Moderna that's approved for 16 and above? Exactly. So this, yeah, so this person's wondering what to, what about a, uh, uh, her son who's 13 years old who has biliary atresia pre-transplant. And she wants to know what's, sure. you know, what's known about the COVID vaccine in this patient population. You know, I do know that they are looking at some studies. I think uh, it's 13 and older, um, but I have a feeling that patients, um, you know, who have these comorbidities, it might be a little bit longer. Um, you know, so unfortunately, I don't have a perfect answer to that question. I think that it's going to take a little more time for the pediatric population. Uh, obviously, we want to make sure it's safe. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't cause any harm to any patients, um, especially pediatric populations. So I think for this, we're just going to have to take a little time um, before we find out the answer to these questions. 
great. Another question has to do with the um, the way the injection is given, whether it's given intradermally or subcutaneously. And apparently there's data in mice that um, intradermal or subcutaneous is less likely to fully activate the liver immune response. So they're wondering, can liver patients re request that the COVID vaccine be injected intradermally or subcutaneous? So at this point, I would go with how the um, companies have done the studies um, in humans, and that's the intramuscular injection. Um, I wouldn't recommend that we attempt any subcutaneous or, or any other injection site because we just don't have data in humans to say that that would be effective. Um, and I would hate for people to miss out on their immune response if we don't have an effective way. Um, but I'm sure that over time, they're going to be looking into all these different ways of doing the immunizations. Um, to see if there's different ways we can protect our different populations. Excellent. Um, and then another question is, is there a preference for Pfizer or Moderna for liver patients? I don't, I don't have any data to suggest one over the other for liver patients or, or any patient. Um, I know for myself, I was happy to receive either one. A lot of the reason why you'll see a lot of physicians in the hospitals getting the Pfizer is just because of the way it had to be stored. Uh, hospitals had a little easier uh, capability of storing the Pfizer vaccine because you have to have a special freezer. Um, so, um, but you know, I look at it this way: I got the Pfizer vaccine. You know, Dr. Fauci got the Moderna vaccine, so I feel pretty comfortable with both of them. I think really it just has to do with storage. Um, and the capabilities of each facility. Right, I think so, in some cases you don't really have a choice. It's whatever vaccine is yeah. available would, at the time would, that you're called to get your vaccine. Yeah, I would recommend either one, whatever they have available. If you remember back to that slide, they're basically the same effectiveness. Great. Now there's a couple of questions with respect to certain patient populations. So one question is, do any of the COVID-19 vaccines impact the effectiveness of those who take immunosuppressants like tacrolimus, which may result in increasing the risk of organ rejection? Yeah, so I looked up a little bit of this. Of course, the data is scarce. Um, all the different transplant centers I research into don't feel there's gonna be any increased risk of in rejection. Um, the biggest concern with our immunosuppressed patients, not only liver transplant, kidney transplant, but there are lots of people taking immunosuppressions for other diseases like lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, people with Crohn's disease. Um, the biggest concern is that the vaccine just doesn't work as well, that maybe we don't create an immune response. Um, but we haven't really seen any concerns about there being risk to the patient or to their organ from the vaccine at this point. Great, and then a similar question for a patient with primary biliary cholangitis wants to know, is it safe for me to take the vaccine? Yeah, so I feel like any of our patients with any liver disease that it's safe. However, there's a caveat to that. You know, any of you on immunosuppressants um, or taking specific medications for your diseases, I do think you should talk with your hepatologist just to make sure there's not something specific about your case that they would feel that it's unsafe. Um, at this point, uh, my group, we haven't said no to any of our patients. Uh, we haven't come across a patient that we felt shouldn't take the vaccine um, unless someone had told us they had an allergic reaction, a severe allergic reaction like anaphylaxis to one of those ingredients that I listed in the presentation. Uh, those are the only, you know, which is very few people, obviously, that we have, uh, we said not to get the vaccine, which is a very small amount of people. Great. Okay, another question about um, COVID vaccine and immunity. So did I hear correctly that the COVID-19 vaccines give immunity that is prevent you from getting COVID-19? I thought I heard that you can still get COVID-19 after getting the vaccine but that you may have no symptoms or less severe symptoms. 
So this we don't know 100% yet. Ideally, the vaccine prevents you from getting COVID-19 at all, uh, but I think we'll have to wait for all the data to come out for me to say, oh, 100%, if you get the vaccine and you're immune, you're never going to get the virus or carry it. Um, but when we look at the data from the trials, um, you know, I, it's hard to believe that those thousands and thousands of people didn't encounter COVID-19 over the months that they were watching them. Um, and most likely, uh, you know, they were testing them for the actual virus versus exposure um, versus getting immune. So, you know, my, you know, fingers crossed that this vaccine really does prevent you from getting the infection at all. Great, thank you. Um, is there consideration to ensuring the caregiver gets vaccinated along with the patient, like for our liver patients? Yeah, you know, I know um, it doesn't fit into one of the tiers specifically. Um, I know that, for example, the VA is actually, the Veterans Administration is uh, allowing caregivers of their patients who need vaccines to get vaccinated. But I don't know, Shirley, did you hear anything else about vaccination for the caregivers? Um, if they don't meet the other criteria, I didn't hear for the general population. I don't think that's in the in the tiers. Yeah. I didn't yeah. see that in the tiers. So hopefully, you know, if they meet with other criteria, exactly. Exactly. that would be if the way. And if they're at high risk, right, they're going to meet one of those other criteria. Um, and the whole goal of the vaccine, since we know the mortality rate is, is pretty low, the goal is to focus in on those who we think are going to have a high mortality because of the virus. So I still think whether or not it's a caregiver or anyone else that we still want to keep focused on um, vaccinating the most at risk of contracting the virus and passing it around like healthcare workers. Um, and then also um, those at high risk of, uh, uh, you know, passing away from the virus. We really want to get them vaccinated as soon as possible. Great. Um, another question about uh, having a splenectomy or having your spleen removed. So you had mentioned to not get the vaccine if you had your spleen removed, but someone's wondering, you know, they had their spleen removed during liver transplant, so can they still get the COVID vaccine? So the, for the mRNA vaccine, that wouldn't be an issue. These are just very, you know, those are very specific vaccines you can't get if your spleen's been removed. Um, but with the mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, it won't be an issue. Um, I just want to make sure that as all the new vaccines come out, that if you've had a spleen removed or you're on immunosuppression, um, right now it's kind of easy, right? Because we just have the messenger RNA vaccine to talk about because that's all that's available. Um, but as all these new vaccines come out, it might get a little bit confusing as to which ones you can or cannot get, because eventually I have a feeling we're going to have a lot more than two. We might have five, six, seven, eight different vaccines that are being given, and each one's going to have a little bit different criteria for who can't get the vaccine. So it's really important once it's your turn to get the vaccine that you talk to your, your transplant team or you talk with your primary care doctor about whether it's safe or not for you to get that specific vaccine if you've had your spleen removed. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Um, another question about, actually kind of two questions about transplant patients. Mm -hmm. One is, was there any data gathered from other countries regarding transplant patients? And then actually the same person wants to also know any data on transplant patients getting sick. Sure. So. I don't know. Yeah, we definitely know transplant patients have um, gotten COVID-19. Um, uh, our groups had quite a few of our transplant patients get sick with COVID-19 who are on immunosuppression, um, and most of them have done fine. Uh, quite a few of them were hospitalized, uh, so they had a, maybe a little bit more uh, severe infection. Uh, most of my transplant patients were hospitalized that got COVID-19, uh, but they all have made it out of the hospital um, and did pretty well. Now, that's very anecdotal, so I don't like to, <laughs> you know, say, oh, because my experience is this way, um, that that's how it's going to be everywhere else. 
Um, so it's important that we kind of wait for that information. And I don't have any information on international data for transplant patients at this point that I can share with you. Great. And then um, I think this is the last question so far um, that at least is in the question box. Um, one person is asking, um, apparently the app in Orange County is a little, um, you know, buggy to figure out how to sign up for the vaccine. So she's wondering, or this person's wondering, how are we scheduling it in San Diego? Sure. So on the the website, the fastest way I find it is if I just go into the browser and say, you know, into my web browser and say COVID-19 vaccine in San Diego, it gets us to kind of the county website where you can sign up for the vaccine. I just looked on the website yesterday. A lot of the places aren't scheduling right now, but they do have a new super center that looks like it has I think it's like the Sharp Super Center that looks like it has openings for actually um, today, tomorrow, and the next day. I didn't go through and fill out the whole thing, so I don't know what happens when you put your name and everything and you get to the end if there's still slots open. Um, it didn't actually say that, but it had the link available. Um, so I believe that this location has sites. And then there's, when you're on that page, when you get yourself to that uh, website, then you'll see there's some community clinics that are also doing vaccinations that you can call. Um, but right now, some of them say no appointments available. So you kind of scroll down the, the site and you'll see the different places you can click to get the vaccination. But I know it's it's been a frustration for everyone. I think it's been a little bit difficult to figure out how do I get my vaccine and, and where do I go? And Thank I just know for you. Sorry, I was just going to add to that, Sonia, really quick. I was just going to say that I know for UCSD, the Super Center at Petco Park here in San Diego was closed today for maintenance, and they were closed yesterday for weather. But we're hoping it's going to be back up again tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you, Chair Lee, for a great moderation. That was this was a very informative um, uh, presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Oliver. And no if there is any more questions, please uh, email me. You guys have my phone number, my email. Uh, I will make sure that I will pass that along to our specialists. Thank you very much. Have a good night. All right. Thank you. You guys have a great night. Thank you.